Well then, this should be quite the unique guide for this channel, everyone. There will be hardly any gameplay, as most of our time will be spent in the dang settings for Pete's sake. And really, we're just going to be showing the map, as we need to talk about what said settings will do to our maps. So, let's get to it. To begin, though, let's cover the game mode options here. And we have three available. Survival mode... Endless Mode, and Wilderness Mode. The differences are pretty straightforward though. In Survival Mode, players will become ghosts, like always, and need revival through Telltale Hearts, life-giving amulets, touchstones, you name it. However, if every player in the world becomes Deadzo, a timer begins that will eventually reset the world. And not only that, player ghosts will drain the sanity of those still alive too, which is not great. However, in Endless Mode, things may look the same, but do note the lack of a reset timer. This is due to the fact that while in Endless Mode, players can forever just respawn at the portal along with all the other methods still being available to you if you wish. And like how we discussed yesterday, Endless Mode also enables the Florid Posturn to regrow berry bushes, saplings, and grass tufts every now and then. Oh, and the whole Sanity Ghost thing is not a thing. But Wilderness Mode is where things get very interesting. Not only will you simply just spawn at a random location and not at the floored postern initially, there just isn't a floored postern in general. So, alright then, what's the deal there? How do we go about respawning or whatever in this mode? Well, you don't really have to worry about that, at least not in the usual sense. You could of course use all the other revival mechanics, but let's say you get licked to death or something, the game will just not turn you into a ghost and instead kick you back to the character selection screen. You can then just pick another character of your choice and the game will just plop you right back in at another random location. It is very interesting I guess, but you won't have your original map coverage, so honestly it may just be more annoying than anything. But on to the good stuff, and we shall begin with the biome setting, as I'm sure some of you have no idea what even this simple setting does. We can choose either together or classic. However, what is the difference? Well, with together on, we have all the biomes under the sun. Both deserts, the deciduous forests, and even now, the lunar biome. But if we were to change things to classic settings, we would not have any deserts, no deciduous forests, and no lunar islands. It is like playing the Don't Starve of Old, and well, that is kind of the point here. But it is weird to see on a map in Don't Starve Together. Oh, and classic settings will obviously just decrease the size of your worlds and land masses because you don't have as many biomes as you normally would. We also have the spawn area setting, and this is one that I I know confuses people, but we have three options here. Default, which we will not be bothering to discuss, dark, and plus modes. Plus mode will have it where three chests spawn at the portal filled with crap tons of tools, early game resources, and heck, even buttloads of food. And like, healthy amounts of it all too. I know this is here just to make the early game gathering process easier, but not only is that one of the best parts of this game in my opinion, holy moly, this mode just makes it so dang easy that it might just ruin the experience for you, but play as you wish. I'm not gonna tell you otherwise. And in the dark spawn areas, you will have a campfire and a single chest filled with very basic and low amount of resources, as it is actually meant to coincide with a light out mode world, aka just the world with perpetual night. Not much else to it really. Oh, but the portal may spawn in some interesting places with this setting on. I guess next up would be world size, but do I really need to spend much time here? Small world means a small world, and a huge world means a huge freaking world, so who would have guessed that one? But large worlds are the default, and this is what you'll be looking at for the most part come world generation. However, I gotta say, there is quite the jump from a default large world to a huge one here, so have 
fun. It mostly just comes down to how much you want to walk back to your base. But jokes aside, a bigger world means more resources, so keep that in mind. Ah yes, land branching and land looping, the two things that folk ask about all the dang time, and really the two things that even prompted this video to begin with. To me, they go together like peas and carrots, and I always choose branching most and looping never, but there are some combinations that can truly make for some intriguing worlds. We won't cover those today, we're just going to give you the basics of what each means. So, branching means how much the land will branch out and create, well, branches of land from a chosen center of the world while looping determines how much said land creates a circle and or curve to be more precise. So take for example this world generation here, which has looping on always and branching on never. The world literally attempts to make a circle of land, which used to be really really annoying and maybe kinda still is, but with boats now we can just navigate the water or just build boat bridges across things. And I gotta say, it is kinda cool to have it when the lunar island actually spawns in the middle of this circle of land. But then again, look at what a world looks like with branches on most and looping at never. The world creates branches of land from a center point as best as it can, and this is always the settings that I prefer to choose, but to each their own of course. And in short, more looping means a more circular map, while branches will separate land and thus separate the biomes into, again, branches. So fool around and find which combinations you enjoy, because of course, every world generation is gonna be different regardless. The event setting simply allows you to experience the many seasonal events of Don't Starve Together even when said events are not currently live. You will not be able to get any of these specific rewards, like the skins and such, from these events by doing so. However, most of the other content will still be available in the game. Leaving it on auto will just automatically update your pre-existing worlds for when these events do actually go live again at their specific times of the year, but choosing a specific event will lock that world at that event forever, so be very mindful there. Speaking of seasons though, we can adjust the length of our seasons ourselves as seen here. Again, things are very simple. You either make a particular season longer, shorter, or heck, even just completely remove them from normal play, I don't know why you would do that, but it's an option. Setting them to random though does exactly that. You can have a 30 day autumn, a 5 day winter, a 2 day spring, and a 50 day summer for all we know. It's just any combination of any amount of days, including just removing them completely. Playing with the seasons can be pretty fun, and actually extending autumn could mean a first season Berger visit, so they do actually have quite the impact on our experiences if we let them. So, enjoy. Oh right, the starting season setting and the day type settings as well. We can choose which season we want to start with. It's just that simple, folks. And we can choose whether or not to have ourselves have longer days, no days at all, longer nights, only nights, and just so much more with the day type setting. There really is not that much else to it. And honestly, the last setting in world generation that needs any sort of explanation would be the starting resources one. This setting determines which type of basic starting resource our worlds will have for the most part, and it impacts things like saplings, grass geckos, and juicy berry bushes. In short, choosing none will spawn the original resources like saplings and normal berry bushes, while adjusting the setting will mix things up with more twiggy trees perhaps, more juicy berry bushes or more normal berry bushes, and perhaps even more grass geckos. So simple enough. Listen folks, I never do or will treat you guys like idiots, so I believe going one by one through the rest of the dang settings would be absolutely insulting. Therefore, I am not going to do it. Not only would it make this video stupidly long and monotonous, they are all self-explanatory. 
You either make things faster in growth, more frequent in occurrence, increase their spawning numbers, etc. There is no need for me to tell you that. I will say this though. Changing things to more or lots can and will overpopulate the world and somewhat break the spawning of creatures and resources so you really should only be doing so on your own accord. Cause things can get chaotic and maybe even stupidly broken very quickly. And as for caves generation, there ain't much else to add as those settings follow obviously a very similar principle. But a friendly reminder anyway, you need to actually turn on the caves initially to even have them in the first place. Place. And trust me, people ask me that all the time. But thanks for watching, folks. Well wishes to all. I hope the world generation RNG gods are on your side, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.